leaders of China and the United States meet to ease tensions between the two countries. What could this mean for the bilateral relationship? Hello, I'm Arnold Neider and this is The Heat. Chinese President Xi Jinping met with his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden for about three hours in Bali in Indonesia. It was their first in-person meeting since Biden took office. President Xi pointed out that much can be done to improve the relationship between the two countries. China and the U.S. have gone through 50-plus eventful years with gains and losses. Currently. China-U.S. relationship is at the hearts of everyone. The world expects that China and the U.S. will properly handle their relationship. Our meeting today has attracted the world's highest attention. We should work with all countries to bring more hope to world peace, greater confidence in global stability, and stronger impetus to common development. To discuss this important meeting, let's bring in our panel from Portland in Oregon. Yan Liang is Chair Professor of Economics at Willamette University. Nason Mabubi is a research scholar at the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. He joins us from Philadelphia. Joseph Gregory Mahoney is a professor of politics and international relations at East China Normal University in Shanghai. And from Beijing, Victor Gao is a chair professor at Suchow University. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Victor Gao, let me start with you. This is a long-awaited face-to-face meeting between President Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden. Uh, it took place in Bali in Indonesia. It was a three-hour meeting during which both leaders vowed to get this relationship back on track. A high-level meeting, Victor, what do you think it achieved? First of all, the uh, summary meeting between President Biden of the United States and President Xi Jinping of China would, in historical term, be viewed as a landmark breakthrough meeting because it managed to set the floor to the bilateral relations and also built guardrails for China-U.S. relations. Therefore, I think going forward, the two countries will be encouraged to do whatever they can to boost the bilateral relations from what it is today, and it will require all the wisdom and courage and vision and resourcefulness, for example, to see how these two countries can improve their relations despite of all their differences. I think President Biden's declaration that there is no Cold War and he does not seek a Cold War between China and the United States will be very important. And also his reaffirmation of the One China policy will also be very important. I hope all this will turn out to be what he means, what he says, for example, and it will really avoid a sliding away of China-U.S. Re relations into a deeper abyss. In that sense, let's congratulate for this summit meeting, even though there are still many, many challenges and difficulties to be worked out between these two countries. Joseph Gregory Mahoney, uh, th there was some very straight talk from both leaders. President Biden reiterated the One China policy, and he said he did not think that there was any imminent invasion, any attempt on the part of China to invade uh, Taiwan. That's despite what the U.S. media have been telling its audiences and readers for months now. Uh, but if we look at the tone of this meeting, would it be fair to say that these were two equals talking to each other? We saw mutual respect a mutual recognition that no one side has the advantage here. They've got to put their heads together to get this relationship uh, back to where it should be. I think on the whole, we can say that, that there's, you know, that, that the meeting appears to demonstrate uh, some sort of threshold of, of basic respect. And I share, you know, in part, some of Victor's optimism, uh, or at least hope, that this will help the two nations uh, erect uh, proper guardrails and that we will avoid going down the same path that has largely been uh, uh, plotted by the United States over the past six or seven years. Uh, that said, the, the one thing that, that, that really concerns me is that we know that this kind of meeting is precisely what the United States has in mind 
when it talks about managing the relationship while doing a, a number of other things uh, to destabilize the relationship on other fronts. And Beijing is well aware of this. Beijing talks about this problem uh, again and again. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we don't have military-to-military -military communication now, which is a very dangerous thing. It's one of the reasons why the two countries aren't negotiating and cooperating on climate change right now. Uh, both things that, that are, are existential issues for the, for the betterment of, the, of, of both countries and the, the world at large. So when Biden talks about managing the relationship again, as he did during this meeting, I always get the sense that there's a type of paternalism here, that, that, there, you know, that, that there's almost like talking to a child. So on the one hand, yes, there, there, there is sort of a, a, a respect, um, a, a grudging respect. But uh, I still uh, am not very confident that we're moving in, 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 a, in a direction of true mutual respect, given all the other things that are happening and need these type of management comments. Joseph, there has been a belief among many commentators and analysts that, uh, you know, you mentioned that managing the relationship. Uh, there has been a belief that this is about containing China's rise. Do you think that is still part of U.S. policy? I think it absolutely is. But, you know, we're seeing uh, uh, a number of uh, developments. Uh, I, I, the, the, the containment strategy, by, by some accounts, appears already to be falling apart. And we, we see this in part by uh, Schultz visiting. We see this in part by uh, certain leaders of, of chip companies pushing back against uh, the U.S. Uh, tech decoupling efforts. We see this with the general secretary of, Communi uh, of Vietnam's Communist Party coming. Um, th there's this, this growing consensus, I think, among certain analysts that uh, because of the conflict in Ukraine, because of the pandemic, because of the outsized position that, that China plays in bilateral trade with most countries in the world, that no one can really afford to follow the United States down what is clearly very clearly a containment strategy at this point, and that uh, what this is going to do is provoke through time uh, the U.S. trying to take a more coercive stand against its own allies and thereby risking uh, uh, fracturing its own alliances. And, and the, the key at this point is that China just needs to avoid uh, being drawn into uh, any sort of direct conflict despite provocations and uh, let time work its magic. Victor, what are your thoughts on what Joseph just, just told us? When we talk about, or when the United States talks about managing the relationship, is it about containment? First of all, from the Chinese perspective, anyone to contain China will seem really ludicrous. How can you contain China with a population of 1.4 billion people plus? How can you contain an economy of China's size, which is... Uh, more than almost six times as big as India's population. So I think a containment strategy in itself will fail and will backfire. And for the United States and China, the two economies highly independent with each other, intertwined with each other, to contain China will bring devastating uh, damages to the U.S. interest in itself. Therefore, I think uh, it's much better to figure out a better way, that is to get along with China and figure out the red lines on each side and try to avoid stepping on the each line of the United States or of China. And I think the world we will uh, meet in the future will be a better world. It will be a world of peace, development, mutual respect between China and the United States, rather than, for example, a world which will trigger an escalation and a rivalry, conflict, or even war between these two very important and the largest two economies in the world. I think there is a better way. And hopefully, President Biden and President Xi Jinping in Bali have managed to figure out the prospect of a better way for China and the United States. Yang Liang, as Victor points out, these are the world's two biggest economies, but it is a relationship, when we talk about the economic relationship and the trade relationship, it is uh, being bedeviled by a number of issues, including the trade war. So when you hear these leaders talk about getting the relationship back on track, from an economic and trade point of view, what does that mean? Yeah, good to talk to you, Anand. Um, so I agree with the two uh, previous speakers. I think I do remain cautiously optimistic about the summit and also about its directions. 
um, because the two leaders are willing to sit down and have three hours and 12 minutes of talk, I think that really indicates how important this relationship is for both countries and for the entire world. But unfortunately, I think, you know, when you read the readouts from both countries, you do see very stark, uh, you know, difference and contrast. And I agree that, you know, from the Biden side, they did say that they are going to compete vigorously with China and work with allies um, to have, you know, constructive efforts um, so to, to around the world, right? So in some ways, I think this seems to say that they are going to, in some ways, contain or slow down China's development, especially when it comes to technology. Um, as we know, back in October, uh, Biden's administration has extended the ban on exports of semiconductors to China. So I think in addition to this tariff war that's been ongoing, um, there's also this extended sort of attack war. Um, so I think, you know, from China's reality, it clearly says that President, Xi, uh, sorry, President Biden states that, you know, a peaceful and developing China is in the interest of the United States and U.S. seeks no Cold War, um, no containment. So I think there is a very stark contrast. And so I think that is very concerning. And um, I think economics is definitely a, a place, a, a, a ground for both countries to work together. I think this is not just Biden saying it, but also Janet Yellen um, also talked about that, you know, we need some macroeconomic policy coordinations. We need to work together on, you know, global debt relief and many other issues. And yet I think um, in, in practice, right, that tech war and the trade war are still, I think, um, really against those countries' interests. Nathan Mabubi, um, for months now, well, could even say even years now, we've been hearing very harsh rhetoric on both sides when we talk about this relationship, mainly from the United States side. But did you detect a new willingness on the part of the United States now with this visit to engage with China? You know, I was thinking that for the last at least six years, Every few months, uh, there will be some commentary that says this is the lowest moment in U.S.-China relations in 40 years. And each time, it's said again and again. So I very much agree that the last few years have been very tempestuous. And we may have a floor now after this meeting, but of course, we don't know. Um, my belief is that that has been something that has generated from both sides. It's not something that only the United States uh, has contributed to. But this meeting, at least the optics of uh, President uh, Biden and General Secretary Xi um, meeting with smiles uh, on that stage in Bali, uh, shaking hands very warmly um, in their opening remarks, both uh, making very warm comments to each other, and then having that three-hour uh, meeting. Um, all of that is obviously uh, very promising on the surface. Um, I do think there's a lot to be seen now, of course. Um, we know that uh, Secretary of State Blinken uh, is going to be going to Beijing sometime in the new year. And my hope, and I think the hope of a lot of people on the U.S. side who are concerned about the deterioration of the relationship, is that that will only be an opening to further exchanges between the two countries, including at the governmental level. Um, back before this sort of downturn in relations, there were well over 100 uh, governmental meetings, um, different kinds of dialogues at the governmental level, that's gone down to zero. Essentially, now we just have these high-level meetings. Mm -hmm. It would be great to see those come back. And what is of particular concern to me is that the wider people-to-people -people exchange that we had until right before the pandemic, that that come back as soon as possible as well. So yes, positive. Yes, lots of things to maybe hope for going forward. But I think there's a lot left to be seen in terms of further implementation. And hopefully, these channels will expand beyond simply the meetings at the very top level. Yes, and of course, we live in a world that is changing very quickly. I mean, situations change. Uh, there are new challenges emerging all the time. But in this instance, when you look at the meeting that took place in Bali, uh, from the U.S. point of view, has something changed? I think from the U.S. point of view, um, there is clearly a moment here where um, President Biden is coming out of a midterm election in which his party did quite well. And so there may be a little bit more confidence um, on his part and his administration's part um, in terms of what they want to do on the world stage that might be controversial vis-a-vis -vis the other party. Um, we do know that um, the China issue has become a politicized issue in the U.S. And so I think it's very good that President Biden went into this meeting at a moment of maximum political strength in much the same way that President Xi Jinping did. 
Um, so there could be uh, something to be seen in that, but I think more broadly, there is a growing recognition in D.C. and perhaps especially within the administration that the relationship has gotten too toxic and that that in and of itself is a problem. So there may be some new interest in toning down the toxicity of the relationship. I think, although I'm less familiar with it, that that is probably the case in Beijing as well. Um, that again, President Xi Jinping is coming out of this party Congress meeting with a new level of political strength and also a new um, concern about the toxicity of the relationship given all the challenges that are before China as well. And so I think on both sides, there might be some new spirit of let's see if we can work something out where the relationship does not descend further into the abyss that it's pointing towards in the last few years. Victor Gar, after the meeting, President Biden talked about the Taiwan issue. Let's listen to some of what he had to say. The one China policy, our one China policy has not changed, has not changed. We oppose unilateral change in the status quo by either side, and we're committed to maintaining the peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits. So, Victor, if we're listening to what the president said there, just a month ago, a senior U.S. defense official, the chief of naval operations, Admiral Michael Gilday, was talking about a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. He said it might happen this year. It could happen next year, in 2023. So how significant is that statement that the president made? I mean, is the military uh, top brass in this country totally out of touch with the political leadership? First of all, if you understand the uh, power structure in the United States, it's very fortunate that the United States president commands the U.S. armed forces rather than the other way around. Secondly, I hope President Biden uh, meant what he said in Bali, and the United States is really serious in sticking to this one China policy, because otherwise uh, the world will be completely out of mind and it will be a very, very dangerous world. And Thirdly, I think it is universally recognized and acknowledged, including by the United States, that there is only one China and Taiwan is part of China. This policy has formed the rock stone upon which China-U.S. relations have been developed uh, since January the 1st, 1979. And this actually has generated huge benefits for the American people as well as for the Chinese people. And therefore, I hope President Biden has fully realized that this one China policy is not only good for China and for both sides of the Taiwan Strait, it is actually very good for the American fundamental national interest. Therefore, I hope the top brasses in the United States will heed what their commander in chief is saying and will need to readjust their policy accordingly. Now, the admiral may have confused China's capabilities with China's intention. I think there was a former leader of Taiwan, uh, Ma Ying-jeou, President Ma Ying-jeou, who said that ever since the beginnings of the 1960s, China's mainland had already acquired significant and sufficient military capacities to take Taiwan by force. But why it has taken so many decades that China has never demonstrated any real eagerness to uh, take over Taiwan by force, to achieve national reunification by force. Because China, ever since the beginnings of the 1980s, has been promoting mm -hmm. the peaceful reunification of Taiwan and has never emphasized the use of force. Therefore, this is the better way. This is the highway between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. All parties involved need to work hard to create more conditions so that there will be greater rapprochement, better understanding between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait, leading towards eventual peaceful reunification. Why should anyone really uh, uh, putting any momentum towards separatism and independence of Taiwan? Because first of all, it's never going to be allowed. Secondly, that dangerous path will generate huge damage to both sides of the Taiwan Strait, right. and it will completely undermine China-U.S. relations.
Joseph Gregory Mahoney, uh, Ukraine was discussed. That's no surprise. That's an issue that's been preoccupying the minds of leaders throughout the world. And both leaders, President Biden and President Xi, expressed their respective concerns uh, over the conflict there and the risk that it could escalate to the point where nuclear weapons uh, may be used. China has previously blamed NATO's expansion in some instances or NATO's intentions to expand right up to the borders of Russia for this conflict. But how much leverage does China have in an international issue like this, or perhaps in many of the other issues that the world faces right now? Well, I think when we speak of leverage, uh, we have to realize that China has, from the beginning, taken a neutral position. I don't think they have looked for leverage, uh, uh, say, uh, over uh, President Putin or Russia. Um, rather, they have encouraged uh, restraint. Uh, they have sympathized with both sides. I don't think they have uh, said that uh, NATO uh, or Ukraine alone were responsible for this, um, but that they bear, that they bore some responsibility. I think that's fair, certainly as the United States has accelerated um, uh, the conflict through uh, leading um, uh, itself and Europe into uh, this very substantial uh, proxy war in lieu of uh, seeking uh, more constructive negotiated uh, resolutions. Um, you know, I think I think the, the the key talking point on all of this to, to connect it to the larger geostrategic uh, position is that it's been the United States objective, strategic objective for decades to um, uh, split uh, Germany from uh, Russia, uh, previously the Soviet Union, in terms of energy dependency. And that, that strategic objective has largely been met now um, at great expense to Germany, perhaps even at the expense of Germany's economy. And this is one of the reasons why Schultz broke ranks uh, recently and came to visit Xi in Beijing. And I think that this is uh, the, the sort of the, the new benchmark, uh, because this was followed by the leader from Vietnam. And this is where we really see uh, some dangers with, with the U.S. containment policy, I think, starting to fracture as people begin to look at what are the possible consequences of following the United States down this path, including the path into uh, Ukraine. Yang Liang, getting back to the trade and economic relationship, the United States says that it has no intention of decoupling from China. But we have seen uh, in the past uh, that the United States has expressed its intention to lessen what it calls its dependence on China's supply lines or supply chains uh, coming out of China. Um, we've seen the situation that existed between uh, with the semiconductor war and also with uh, what has happened to Huawei. How do you see this issue playing out? Right. So I think we see exactly, you know, what is words and what is in action. I think in words, um, yes, there is the um, claim that there should not be decoupling because that is against the interest of both countries and to the global economy. But I think, indeed, we have seen the sweeping um, export control. Um, you know, I think it's very clear that this is a tactic to control and to contain China's technology development. It's not just for that small areas of national security concern. So I think moving forward, um, I believe, you know, Biden administration should really look into these economic ties. I mean, after all, these two countries do have over $550 billion to trade and also over $118 billion of stock of foreign direct investment. And it is in the interest of the business community and the American people to have these normal trade and exchange and you know, capital uh, sort of uh, business relationships. Um, so I think it is in the interest of both countries to look into these economic ties and really trying to construct a more um, competitive, but then also beneficial relationships when it comes to you know trade investment and technological cooperation. Yang Liang, very briefly, uh, if you could please, um, the trade tariffs. Do you see any quick easing of those tariffs? I think what we heard last time um, from Captain Chai is that now that this China has a new economic team, mm -hmm. they're going to hold this wait and see approach and right. see what China is going to implement its specific economic policy. Um, the Biden administration has been uh, always accusing China's so-called non-market practices. Um, but again, I think, you know, when it comes to industrial policy, the U.S. is implementing it uh, at the same time. So it's not clear okay. what they mean by these non-market practices. Nathan Mabubi, the United States says it will send its Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to China early next year. Uh, Washington says the goal of that is to keep lines of communication open. So where do you see this going? You know, I think, again, like I said earlier, um, there is this 
sort of a pattern developing of high level conversations. So there's the uh, series of conversations virtually between uh, Presidents Biden and Xi. Um, and now in person, um, there was the meeting uh, back in March of uh, last year um, in, in Anchorage uh, that was, of course, very contentious. Mm -hmm. um, there has been subsequent meetings, um, including um, some U.S. officials who have gone uh, to, to China, including Wendy Cutler. Or, um, uh, and, and then, of course, you have, um, you have uh, this, this, this visit going uh, forward now. I think that's fine, but the concern that I have and that I think others share is that that's not enough to really um, prevent the relationship from continuing to deteriorate. We do need a wider range of, um, of ties. And so, you know, until we get to that point, each of these meetings will sort of have the same kind of conversation around them. And, and it's fine. It's better that they're meeting um, than they're not. Mm -hmm. But um, I am very much hoping that eventually we can break out of this ongoing pattern and have a much deeper and wider set of interactions um, like we had really right up until the pandemic um, and that we do not have at the moment. Right, Victor, I've got less than a minute left, but I'm wondering how will this meeting be seen in the region? And we have seen many regional leaders recently uh, talk about the fact that uh, they don't want to be placed in a position where they have to choose sides, choose between China and the United States. Absolutely. I think the most difficult thing for the ASEAN member states, for example, and many other countries in our part of the world to make is to choose between China or the United States. I think this meeting in Bali has probably made their night uh, better, safer. They can breathe more freely because I think going forward, the reality, the prospect of a complete fallout between China and the United States has been more managed. And China and the United States will uh, develop a more constructive relations right. despite all their differences. And I think this will be the condition for better peace and stability in East Asia, in Southeast Asia, and in the world at large. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CGTN America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter. That's at CGTN America. I'm Arnon Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.